Hi everybody, it's Anne with Art on the Creek. Thanks for joining me today. Once again, we are in my home studio in Parker, Colorado. And thank you so much for voting on my community tab. Those of you who saw the butterfly pictures and voted on which one you would like to see painted, today's the day. Are you ready? Let's go see who won the election. Here we go. For those of you who didn't see or don't remember, here are the three pictures that I posted in that community tab post asking you which one you would like to see a tutorial on. And I will tell you what, the votes were so close that um, there's only one that nudged just a teensy bit ahead of the others. So this is going to be a compilation of all three. Oh, I just shot my little rubber band. It hit the window above my desk. Um, the paints that I'm going to be using today are the custom mixes that I made. I've got those palettes over there to the left because I thought that maybe I would use those up, but I didn't actually end up doing that on these uh, on these paints. But I like this one for what we're painting. There's a lot of darks and good greens for mixing, and of course those beautiful uh, oranges and yellows and reds for the butterflies. So here's the brushes I'm going to use for the first one. These are the Meaden brushes and in fact that is Meaden watercolor that is over there on those palettes and I'll talk about all those in tomorrow's video but today we're going to be using the Arches Travel Journal. It's cold press 100% cotton and by the way the Meaden watercolor paper is also 100% cotton. In tomorrow's video I am going to review this set with the Meaden um, art supplies. Today I'm using a, a different sketchbook but I'll review everything tomorrow. There will be an affiliate link, there will be a coupon, so if you guys are in the mood to do some art supply shopping I've got some money saving coupon for you with an affiliate link and again that will be in tomorrow's video. But for now let's go ahead and focus on painting these butterflies. I'm going to whip through this sketch here. I am so sorry I forgot to make a PDF out of this first one, but I do have all of the reference photos linked for you in the description and I will have PDFs available with a Dropbox link for the other two butterflies. But for now, I decided to do this one kind of a squarish format. The, uh, the paper that I'm using is that Arches 100% Cotton Cold Press Travel Journal and I love it, but it's, it's a, kind of a six by nine. Uh, orientation so I wanted to make this one a little bit more square so let's get these brushes open let's get started here's a better view of that rinsing vessel I really like this thing it's heavy it's solid it's glazed beautifully and it's got that uh, rough texture on the bottom so it won't slide around the brushes are not bad they're nylon so you do kind of have to watch to make sure you don't get any extra water on the ferrule because you can run the risk of letting a droplet of water go down on your paper where you may not want it but um, you know, I think overall, I think they're fine. I have no problem with the brushes. And actually, I thought I would. I thought I wouldn't like the brushes, but I, I do. So um, for this first one, let's go into the paints that I'm using. I have a video that I made of these mixes that um, it's kind of like a, if you wanted to make your own multi-pigment paints, what would you do? And that's the video. I'll put another card up here. That is the video that um, these paints were created, this particular palette. And I really enjoy this, you guys. I used Mission Gold, the Magello Mission Gold paints to make these mixes. And I love them. And I thought that maybe using this nylon brush would be an issue with them, and they're not. So I'm just kind of going into some varying shades that I have mixed here. Um, yellow ochre is the first one I went down because what we want to do is we got to remember with this one that that butterfly and the bark and the rock they're all kind of the same color family so we really have to make that butterfly subject stand out so in order to do that I'm really going to try and keep the rock fairly light and um, the individual pieces of bark I'm only going to accent a few of them and put some details on just a few so to do the rock what I'm working on is you put down some clean water this technique is called wet on wet and what you can do is just think of the colors that you see in rocks in nature and where I live the rocks that we have are granite or sediment so there often is a lot of red in them and that's what I'm reaching for now is a kind of a, a red um, you could use yellow ochre I've got some green mixing in here with the red to make a darker kind of a, a rich purpley color and uh, just really having fun putting different textures different shades in the rock here when you're working on a rock um, trying to give you some tips about what I think of here when I'm working on a rock. I like to think of how textured the rocks are, how varied they are in color, 
and by going down with that yellow ochre first and remember your watercolor is going to turn a couple shades lighter after it uh, it dries but this particular one doesn't have too big of a color shift. Some of them have more, but the Magellan Mission Golds don't have a, a huge color shift. It's, it's probably, I would say, about average for professional paint. But this is what's fun. I've got the paper towel kind of folded in a, oh, I don't know, a little U shape. And I'm just turning my wrist and tapping it in that wet paint just to try and add some texture. There's a lot of ways that you can add texture to things. Uh, one of them is dry brush, and we'll do that when we do another layer here, but I wanted to kind of lift off some of that rock face. So I've done the wet on wet. I've gone in with some yellow ochre. I've gone in with some uh, permanent red deep, and I mixed in some of that uh, phthalo blue or bamboo green just to kind of try and get some neat purple shades going. And now for the bark, I'm going in with the Van Dyke brown. You could use a burnt umber if you don't have this one. That would be a fine substitution, or even a sepia. If you have sepia, that would work too. I'm going around everything. I'm filling in the entire area with a very light wash. With watercolor, one of the best things you can do to do yourself a favor is to use light washes. So this is something that in this particular instance, this is going to work out really well to our advantage. So we're just going in with a very light wash, and this is just straight Van Dyke Brown. And as soon as I have this covered, now there are some in the, in the reference photo, there are some pieces of moss covered rock in amongst that bark. So I'm going to go in now with the paper towel and kind of shape it very carefully and lift out where I've drawn those little spaces for those rocks. And I think I've just got three or four of them in here. Um, lifting out is a good technique to remember when you're working in watercolor because if you miss something, paint over something accidentally, as long as you're not working with a watercolor that's too terribly staining, you're going to be fine and you'll be able to lift it out with a paper towel and have no problem. So let's dry this. And now I've switched brushes. I'm still using these Meaden brushes. Um, I, this time I'm kind of going into a little bit of that green that's on my palette there, which is kind of a mix of the a bamboo green and a sea glass. That the, the big motivation for me to make this mixed palette was a lot of my favorite paints that Da Vinci makes that are multi-pigment uh, mixes. And I would just wanted to see if I could replicate them on my own. So I'm using uh, colors here that just may not you may or may not have. Um, I would say a phthalo green mixed with a yellow ochre would be just perfect for this. So this, the body of this butterfly is really kind of interesting. It's, it's kind of a, a fuzzy brownish green yellow, so I wanted to get an awful lot of colors going in there. These brushes by Meaden, they don't have direct translations for their size. Like for instance, is it a round number eight, number four? I would say this one is almost the same size as a six. I, in most places, I would call this a six round. They have really a nice point to them. And I like that they make it very easy for you to manipulate the paint. These would be ideal for gouache. Um, I think that uh, using them with, uh, with watercolor is, like I said, the only challenge you have to look out for is the amount of water that's, that's there. And I, I didn't have any trouble controlling anything. So I was fine with all of that. So, okay, the, the Da Vinci uh, dupes <laughs> that I made that I'm going in with, the first one was Soul Shine. So I would say you could use an Indian yellow. And then I'm going over it with what I call Rose Gold, which is a mix of, uh, I think it is a yellow ochre and, let me pull it out here so I can tell you, yellow ochre and a PR-176. So you could use probably alizarin crimson if you just added some uh, yellow ochre to it or maybe uh, cad red and add some yellow ochre. And that way you'd have um, a little bit of a, a reddier red. Anything that, that's kind of about the color of blood is what I was going for here. So I'm just depositing the pigment. Now this is all wet on dry. I'm depositing the pigment closest to the body and then I'm using a wet brush to kind of spread it around and that way you can see you end up with a gradient of color. That's something that you'll do often in watercolor and that it's such a fun thing to play with that way because you're able to create subtle nuances and textures in whatever you're painting just by how much water you're putting down and, and how you want to manipulate that. So it's watercolor is just so fun, you guys. And I really hope that you get a chance to, to play with this and put some different layers down. So now I've gone in with a little bit of that burnt sienna so that uh, while everything is all still kind of wet and damp and I can mix this on the surface so I can have those kind of an ombre effect without having to actually mix it into one uh, one definite color or one value, I can keep those colors visible by letting them mix on the paper 
only a little bit and that's the thing I really like about this brush it's not that you can't do it with another brush but you can do it really well with this one is controlling where you want those colors to go and where you want them to mix I, I just had so much fun with that uh, this again is this Van Dyke Brown and now let's go in and let's take a look at this bark situation this little section is kind of fast and furious. You'll see I'm just going over with another glaze of that Van Dyke Brown and I am avoiding the pieces of bark that I wanted to highlight. Since I don't have a PDF line drawing of this for you, and again, I apologize, I just um, would encourage you to just draw a few of those pieces of bark. If you really want to get down and dirty and do the whole thing, you know what would look really cool is if you went in there with uh, an ink pen, something that would not bleed, and did all of those uh, pieces of bark and all of the little wood chips individually, uh, and then went in with a tint. I, um, I never had that kind of patience. <laughs> So this is what you get. You get uh, a little bit of texture in the background and some definite pieces of bark showing through. So right now what I'm doing is I'm just kind of taking that same Van Dyke Brown and I mixed it with what I call Anne's Gray. And I believe that one is probably a mix of uh, Ultramarine and Burnt Sienna. That's my favorite gray to make. So I probably have mixed that. I don't exactly remember what the combo is. You could use Payne's Gray. You could use, uh, in fact, Payne's Gray would be really nice through all of these butterfly paintings because it's got a blue tint to it. It has a, a it skews blue. Um, so now we're going to use that same gray to create this little cleft in the rock. Now the light on this particular subject is pretty much directly overhead and just a little bit away from us. So it's, it's, let's see how can I explain that. Your, your shadows are going to be towards the bottom of your painting pretty much directly due south um, and not very big shadows. So, so keep them short and keep them right to the, to the south, right at the bottom <laughs> of whatever it is you're painting. So now I'm trying in an effort to make that rock have more texture and dimension. You see, I, I put in that cleft on the, the part right above the butterfly's head and that is a little like a divot in the rock that definitely is in shadow. And then we wanted to highlight the shadow just along the edge right under his wing that goes off to the right of the page and then along the bottom of the rock. Now what I'm doing is I'm taking all those same rock colors and I'm just kind of skimming across the texture of the paper. This is that dry brush technique that I mentioned before and it's one of my favorites. I really like really like using yellow ochre to glaze over whatever texture I've got under there for a rock because it just it has just enough of a, a gold and it's it's a little bit uh, opaque I think it's a, a semi-transparent or a semi-opaque pigment and it will give you a nice ruddy natural earth texture that burnt sienna what are some other good rock colors to use um, you can use this van dyke brown I use some of that permanent red deep you could use alizarin crimson to mix in with all of these the burnt sienna the Payne's gray um, any kind of burnt umber raw umber any of those natural earth tones if you had a red iron oxide that would be great too Anything that you can mix in that is an earth pigment, that is going to give you really great rock color and texture. So let me finish up this and then we'll move on to the next part. Now that you have all that texture on the rock, I know it still looks kind of two dimensional, but we're going to go ahead and make it look a little more 3D now. So remember I told you the shadows are going to be directly below. So to try and envision these wood chips as 3D, we're going to focus on adding this Payne's Gray in. Now the easiest way to do this is either uh, to go wet into damp or do a wash of water over what you've got if it's already dried and then add little bits of pigment in. You just need to be careful of how much water is in the pigment that you're adding in. You want it to be about the same value as however wet the paper is. Does that make sense? You want it to kind of have the same amount of water because if you have too much water then you're going to end up with a cauliflower bloom or a back run and you know that's not always a bad thing. A lot of times when we paint we like to use those but in this case we wanted to kind of avoid them. So you want to be very aware of your water to pigment ratio. I'm doing the striations on the side of the rock here trying to get that yellow pulled in and brought up again to make some more texture on the top and then I think we can put some texture in that wood. Let's see what's next. Before we move on to the wood I'm just putting a very thin glaze over that corner of the rock there and then blotting some of it off. It's very subtle but in this shot I think you can see how it left some natural highlights and uh, and shadows in that. Remember when when we depict form uh, in our paintings. It's just a matter of adding light and shadow or taking away some light and shadow. Um, this is my mix of green. Um, 
I did one that was like snow, uh, Denise's green. I called it my Soden green. And then this one, unfortunately, I cannot read my, oh, oh, yes, of course. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Joyce's mother green uh, is at, after Joyce Hicks. She's a wonderful artist. So is Denise Snowden. Both of them, Soden, excuse me, both of them have worked with Da Vinci as have many other artists to create custom watercolors. And so again, that was my uh, my impetus for making this particular palette. But the mine on the the second the darker green there uh, that I use is called Anne's Mama Green. And that's what I'm using now in here. I'm mixing it with a little bit of bleed proof white because I wanted to get kind of a, a nice uh, mossy green color. Using gouache or some kind of bleed proof white and tinting it with watercolor is a great way to go if you're working for uh, working to try to get something that is like that texture where you have, or excuse me, like that color value where you have that seafoam green or very light. If you don't have a gouache, I would suggest using uh, a pigment like Green Earth or uh, some kind of a cobalt green, something that's really going to give you a lot of granulation and something that will uh, that you can make very sheer and will, won't put down a whole lot of pigment. So now we're working on the bark. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into all of these and just kind of skim over each one with a little bit of dry brush with some yellow ochre. And now that that step is finished, I'm still working with that Van Dyke Brown tinted with some of that uh, Anne's Gray, or you could use, again, like I said, a Payne's Gray. You could even use a black if you have a black. You know what would look really cool on this is a PBK 11. If you have like a, a lunar black or a Mars black, something that's going to granulate a lot is adding texture. You could add a lot of really distinct shadows to the rock and some good texture with that. I, I'm a huge fan of using granulating paints when you're painting anything natural because that texture that occurs in nature is so random. And when you're using good paper like this, like this arches, and you've got a granulating pigment, it's just a match made in heaven. And you're able to create all of those subtleties and nuances uh, in, uh, that occur in nature that you probably couldn't replicate as easily um, on your own. So at least I know that's definitely true of me. <laughs> so I didn't have those pigments this time, but um, I think I like the way that this bark came out. So let's keep working on that. Now I've got that all dry. I did use a heat tool for all of the drying on these in between steps. And now I've gone to a very small brush. I would say if you have a liner brush or you could do this with a number two if you had a really good point. Um, this one, it's, it's very, very nice. And like I said, they don't really uh, uh, list these as a number size of a brush. It's the smallest one that they have in the set, which says on here, it's a detail brush of 0.08 inches. So um, just a really nice little round brush in this little set here. And I'm able to go in there with this bleed proof white and create the white on the wings. Just using this bleed proof white to kind of get those white markings and highlights on the butterfly itself. And now let's get into the fine tech paints. Now, if you have any mica paints at all, they will be perfect for this. You can use whatever brand that you have. I just happen to have these and I really like them. I'll link to them in the description. Um, you do have to prep them. Just, that's true of all mica paints. I found anything that's pearlescent or iridescent, you really need to spray them with water ahead of time. So we've got that done. And I'm going to go ahead and go into this gold here. I really love this. I like both of the golds that are in here, to be honest. And I've almost used all of this one. One is a warmer gold and one's a cooler gold. It really doesn't matter what you have, but I kind of felt like, even though he doesn't really have gold on him, I, I kind of thought, or she, I don't know if this is a male butterfly or a female butterfly. I guess that's assuming some things there. It is a yellow-legged tortoise shell butterfly and I just kind of thought this would be a fun time to use iridescent paints. I rarely use them unless I'm making greeting cards or something like that and I thought this might be a fun moment to pull them out and play with them a little bit and I'm trying to keep in mind that the light would be coming from the upper sides or the north side of this painting so that's kind of where I focused this gold uh, in addition to the little dots around his wing. So, you know, sometimes when you see butterflies or dragonflies, their wings can be a little bit iridescent. And if you like to paint those, then I would say get yourself a, a set of iridescent paints. These fine tech might be a little bit more on the pricey side, but the pans are sold individually. So you can definitely um, just buy a gold if that's all you want. And you can also get sets of, they have like the silver gold bronze set, or they've got pastels. I don't know, whatever you feel like you would use in your painting, there's many different iterations of iridescent paints, but I'll link to this particular set since it's the one that I'm demonstrating here for you today. And I'm just kind of trying to, um, to spread that gold around, just adding some water, 
just kind of getting it to look a little furry and a little fluffy. He, he's got a very furry body. Uh, now what I'm going to do, there's another color in here that's called an interference color. Now those are different than mica or uh, pearlescent or iridescent paints. An interference paint means that when you look at it from one direction, it's one color. And when you look at it from the other direction, it's a different color. So this one, the interference on this one happens to be kind of a burgundy and a green. If you paint something like cutthroat trout or uh, fishing flies, an interference paint can be really cool. So that's how I've used it in the past. I'm using it on this guy here. And um, like I said, to be honest, I don't really paint uh, insects or fish that often, but when I do, and when I did use these, I really like the way it came out. So I'm hoping that this works well on this guy today. So in this section here, what I'm doing is going over the butterfly for all of his dark markings. I've got that Van Dyke Brown mixed with um, my gray. You could either use a Payne's gray, like I said, or a black. You could even use indigo, uh, just something to make that, that Van Dyke Brown go to a very dark brown. And I'm just adding the little spots and the shadows in the le in the wings, rather, not the leaves, the wings, and uh, just kind of trying to get those demarcations in so that it has a little bit more uh, uh, texture and dimension to it. And then we'll go under each of these. Now this time I'm gonna switch. I'm gonna switch things up. I'm gonna go in with that gray right there. And I think what I'm going to do is go into the cobalt blue. Now, if you had an ultramarine, you could do that as well. What I'm looking for is a very cool shadow. And right now what we need to do is we need to lift that butterfly off of the rock just a little bit more. So you can see the rock really has some cool shape and dimension to it. That part is okay. We can still work on the, the details of the shadows and everything. But right now we just need to lift the butterfly off of the rock. So the way that that is done is by emphasizing the shadow. And like I said, we're going to keep it to the south. So I went ahead and I laid that pigment down and then I'm coming back in with water, just clean water and pulling that pigment out just a little bit. And what that does is it creates a gradient to the shadow. And that's something that you really want to be aware of too when you're painting that your shadow is always going to be most intense when it's right up against whatever subject it is that you are making that shadow from. So you don't want to have the shadow um, you know, all the same flat value throughout. You're, you're looking for kind of an ombre effect, a gradual shift in um, uh, a more intense value to a, a lighter value. So try and practice that. If you put a line of paint down on a piece of paper and then come back in with a wet brush and just spread that around. So here what I'm doing, I'm doing the same thing. I'm gonna lift the top of the rock away from the side of it, away from the rock face that's, uh, that's shows that the rock has some height here. So I've skimmed that brush along the edge there, and now I am uh, going in with water to create a little bit of softness to that line that's in there dividing the, um, the surface from the edge of the rock. And I'm just kind of making it so that the rock shows, I'm, I'm rather making it uh, so that you can see that the rock has a layer to it. Um, that's the way that I decided to do that. I always stray. I always stray from the reference photos. So, you know, don't, don't mind me. I've kind of, at this point, I've already gone on to my own version of this painting because that's the way I feel in my mind for my art personally, that I feel like art should be is my interpretation of what I saw or what the reference image is. I much prefer to do that over trying to do a photorealistic painting. Now, if you are a photorealistic painter, please, oh my gosh, I, you know, my hat's off to you. I don't have that kind of patience and um, I don't like working in small detail. It's just not my style. So if you like that and that is your style, wonderful. Don't change. Don't, don't try and do what I'm doing unless you want to try painting something in a different style. Um, you can certainly try and get everything to look exactly like the reference photo. If, if that's your jam, if that's what you want to do, go right ahead and I will applaud you thoroughly. Uh, but for me, for my purposes, I like doing a little more loose interpretive uh, version of what I see in my reference photos. Because, you know, art, that's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Art is, you know, what is it? It's, it's something that, yes, it's fun to create and it's beautiful to look at. But, but for me as an artist, what I like to 
rely on art for is to provide a memory for me. What do you guys do with your paintings? What What's your impetus for painting? Why do you choose to paint something that you do? Let me know in the comments. Do you look at a painting and, oh, I remember that day because I painted that picture from when I took my kids to the zoo or when my husband and I were on a cruise or, you know, when I went hiking with my friend and we saw that great view, you know, what is it that a painting is for you? Is it more a technical practice? Is, oh, I remember that. I was working on those brush strokes. Or is it more a memory of something that happened in your life? For me, it's the latter. This journal that I'm creating here today will be a log of what I've done um, over the time it took to fill this journal. I've got my bird series in here and I have uh, lots of Pikes Peak paintings and now I've got these butterflies. So a lot of the paintings that I have are memories of something that's happened to me in my life. And I'm really kind of excited because this particular journal, I am now working back to front. I, that's what I do. I go on the, the right facing page and I work through like you're reading a book and then I start working from the back to the front so I can work on the back of all the pages in a journal. And I'm so excited because I'm almost midway through the back half of this journal and then I'll have another journal to put on my bookshelf and that's what I do with them. And you know what's so funny about this particular journal? I had, um, we were visiting one of my kids and uh, his family and they have this hilarious Labrador puppy. Um, he's not really puppy puppy. He's, he's big, but he's still, he's, he's very galumphy. He's just, he's very goofy and we love him to pieces. Well, I was getting dressed one morning and I heard the slurping over in the corner on my suitcase and I knew that he was licking something, but I thought he was just licking the suitcase. Well, he licked about three of the paintings in here and you know, nothing happened to him. Nothing was toxic. Everything is okay. But now these paintings, I have an additional history to them because the dog licked them and they're beautifully smeared. So now I kind of feel like it's Odin's art too. <laughs> So that's just me though. I love kids. I love chaos. I love all of it. And um, if I had something that precious, I probably wouldn't have left it open on my suitcase. But uh, Odin certainly made his mark on this. Let me just uh, mention something here while I'm making the, the dirt darker there down below so that we can uh, lift that rock up from the dirt. Now we've already lifted the butterfly off the rock, but now we're lifting the, the rock up. Do you see between that area where I'm painting now and the surface of the rock? I'm, I left a very light rim. Um, that's a way to establish that uh, a rock or whatever it is, is higher than your background because it will have an edge to it. And that edge will reflect the light differently than the surface or what's uh, what it's standing on. So I'm just trying to push all of these layers that are below. I'm trying to push them back. And to do that, you use darker values. So let me finish that up and then let's see where we're at. You'll notice that when you're painting, you know, you work on one area and then you go back to another area and realize that it needs work. So what I did after I got the ground in is I realized that that little cleft in the rock just kind of fell flat. It really had nothing going for it. So I'm taking the brush. This is called lifting off. I've just got water on my brush right now and I'm getting it wet, kind of agitating that pigment, just creating a lighter value right there. And then I'm going to go in and darken what's below it. But I think I'm going to add just a little bit of red. I've got a little bit of that, uh, what I call my rose gold. And I'm just adding that in there just to kind of give that a little bit different shape and texture. And then I'm going to repeat that rose gold in the face of the rock so that, uh, so that it will be cohesive. That's another good tip for you guys. Whenever you use a color in your painting, you want to go ahead and use it somewhere else, whether you use it in a mix or um, in some other location on the painting, then that will really help to make your painting a lot more cohesive. It'll give it balance and movement and flow. And that is something we strive to create in art. And it's very easy. There's a lot of this stuff that uh, you might look at it and say, oh my gosh, I could never do that. I just, I could never get it done. Well, you know what? I will tell you that it's just practice. Just like when you were a little kid and you had your piano lessons uh, or even your math homework. Well, how do you think you know your times tables? From practice, it's just practice, practicing your scales, doing all of your, your, uh, your piano practice every day. Painting is no different. It's a talent, but it is learned. It's not anything that any of us are born with. I, my degree is in English. I was lucky enough to have a mother who was an artist and who cultivated this in me and did pay for a lot of art lessons for me. 
And um, then I was able to pursue a lot on my own. And with my degree in teaching in English, I have finally landed here with you guys after I retired. And I couldn't be happier. And I'm very fortunate. I'm very grateful for the path that my life, my life has taken. And I hope that you guys will see that too in your own work, in your own art. Mention in the comments, what are some of the things that you thought you couldn't do that now you can? I mean, these are watercolors, I won't lie. They were a bit of a, a source of frustration for me. I mean, here I was an accomplished artist when I decided to go into watercolor and it knocked me on my butt. I... <laughs> I had to figure out how to use this medium and really once I realized that the paint wants to do some things and it's not all up to me and my control, as soon as I gave up some of that control, then I was able to, to really figure out how I could manipulate things and make them work to my, uh, to my advantage. And that's what I'm hoping to share with you here are these little tips and tricks that I've learned. What are some of your favorite tips and tricks that you figured out uh, well, in your watercolor journey? Um, are you just starting out? Are you brand new? Or have you been painting for a while and you've got a great tip that you'd like to share with everyone? Go ahead and mention it in the comments because I think that, you know, I certainly have my perspective, but we're all friends here. This is a big art community and I know that I'm not the only channel you subscribe to. I subscribe to a whole lot of channels. So let's share our knowledge. Let's figure this out together because we're all doing this together. Let me get this dry and then we'll go on to the next. Well, there you go guess what? I think we're done. I'm so pleased with that rock. You know what? I love painting rocks. And I, I, you know, I may not be the funnest girl at the party, <laughs> but I really love painting rocks. And, you know, if you and I ever cross paths at a party and we see some outside rocks that are interesting, you might see me pull out my sketchbook and <laughs> start drawing. Um, I probably wouldn't take my sketchbook to a party, but if I do get to that point, um, you know, maybe somebody could come give me an intervention. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to give a fun border to this because the square is obviously smaller than the paper. So I've got some room on the side for notes. So I'm just doing a quick little double border here and then I'll write a little bit of note about where I took the photo. Here it is. It is the butterfly exhibit at Denver Botanic Gardens over at Chatfield Farms. If you haven't got a chance to go over there yet, I really recommend that you do. It's just a really unique place to be. It's a historic farm um, that they still cultivate and they have converted it to a beautiful garden as well. So now we're just going to kind of speed through these other two. The um, If you would like to see this next butterfly and the, the one after it, if you want to see those in a more a uh, detailed way like I did this first one with the rock. Let me know in the comments because I'm happy to create new videos to show you how to do the uh, the one where the two butterflies are sitting on the nectar and then the one where the butterfly is on the leaves. So right now I'm just kind of cleaning up my my paper because when you have a sketchbook like this and you close it up well I do a lot of multimedia work in there so I think this is some pastels that has migrated over. So I'm going to use my uh, my eraser and get those out. Now on these next two I do have the PDF drawings for them. So I will go ahead and put those in the description. But meanwhile, let's speed this up and I'll just give a few little quick notes on each one. I'll have a drawing of this one for you, a line drawing in the PDF. It's unfortunately, I'm sorry, the one with the butterfly on the rock. That one I forgot to get a PDF of. I'm so sorry. So, but I do have them for these two drawings. So I will have those available for you through a Dropbox link. And uh, when I took these photos, we were at the Denver Botanic Gardens in Chatfield, and that's in Littleton. It's down um, uh, right up close next to the Hogback, which is a range of mountains that I've painted before and talked to you guys about, part of that fountain formation. At any rate, it's really rugged country, very beautiful, but this, uh, this area was a former farm. And so they cultivate the area and keep the farm working, and they have a test garden. I mean, everything is just so beautiful there, and it's to me, it's a lot more enjoyable to go to than the Denver Botanic Gardens that's more uh, in Denver proper, more downtown, because it's not as busy. It doesn't have quite as many visitors there. And um, they do a pumpkin festival in the fall where you can go pick your own pumpkin. It's just the cutest thing in the world. And I know they have a whole lot of other programs. As a venue, I believe you could rent it out for weddings. They used to do concerts there, but I don't think they do now. So if you have an event, you might want to check them out. I'll put a link to them as well in the description if you're local and you're curious about the Denver Botanic Gardens at Chatfield. 
Uh, this little feeder, I really was drawn to it because the blue and the orange are such a great contrast. Now, when you have two contrasting colors, those are the colors that are opposite one another on the color wheel, you really get a lot of energy and dynamism in your painting. And that means a lot of tension, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things that will attract your eye in a good way. So this particular one, I'm using a cobalt blue. You could use ultramarine, but I, I really like the cobalt in this, and I'm mixing it with some of that Payne's Gray. Just using the Payne's Gray around the edge of the monarch butterfly here. Monarchs will do their thing when they become butterflies. They will do their thing on milkweed, and we have a lot of that that grows wild here in Colorado. At this garden, I saw the most large <laughs> milkweed grove that I've ever seen. It was just huge. I usually see just one or two plants along the trail and they're really cool. They have a beautiful bloom to them. It's kind of pink. I don't think they really have a fragrance though, but um, I don't know, they might. And um, the leaves are kind of fuzzy and then they're about, oh, they're about up to my hip. So they're about three feet tall. And the monarch butterflies, rely on the milkweed plant to become monarch butterflies. So that's something that's really kind of cool. Um, here we are using this fine tech gold again, and I'm using it on this guy because I really wanted to set him apart from the monarch. That monarch is a showstopper, and I think it's just one of those butterflies that everybody knows about. They migrate, they end up down, oh gosh, is it New Mexico? I want to say it's New Mexico. There's so many novels that have been written about monarch butterflies, and I know they have a lot of meaning. Um, we have a lot of butterflies here in Colorado, and unfortunately, all three of the pictures I took were of these orangish kinds of butterflies. We've got the monarch, and then I've got this, uh, this uh, tortoiseshell one, the yellow-legged tortoiseshell butterfly. But what I wanted to do was find this a butterfly that would land on this blue and I was lucky enough I waited for a long time for these butterflies to land and I was lucky enough for orange ones to land now they had yellow ones they had some swallowtail butterflies the one that I really wanted to see that they did not have was a blue streak or a hair streak butterfly I think it's hair streak hair streak yes that is the Colorado State butterfly oh my gosh you guys it's so beautiful it's blue and then it moves into a purple it's just gorgeous. We have yellow swallowtail butterflies in our backyard right now. And I think, well, there's two of them and they're always together. So I don't know. I, I think they're a couple. I know nothing about insects, but um, other than that, they're beautiful. And uh, these guys were just no exception. And there was a lot of black ones around that were landing on this little dish, but I wanted to wait until something colorful landed. And then luckily, my patience paid off. You know what's funny though? They can see you. You don't think that they can. I mean, maybe you do. It just seems kind of obvious when I say it now, but they can see you coming. And every single time that I pointed my camera at them, my phone to get a picture and I stayed back and I used the little, you know, the tele zoom and the, all, all of that kind of stuff, whatever it's called, telephoto lens, the zoom, I used it all. But as soon as I got close enough, they closed their wings. So thank goodness for live photo because I was able to edit that one to uh, the next one we're going to do here. I was able to edit it so that I could definitely get an image with the wings spread out. So I'm just using that cobalt blue mixed with a little bit of that Payne's gray to get the shadows under the butterflies and then all of this last minute detail in here. And uh, the brush I'm using right now, by the way, is a number four. Is it a four? Better double check. Yes, it's a number four Traquel brush. It's from their Protégé series. I love the point on these. They're great for doing detail. So what I'm going to do with this is just kind of um, get the brush wet and pull that shadow around so that it's a little bit more merged with what I've got going on here. And then let's see what final details we can add to this one. It is time for that bleed proof white. I love this product. I use it a lot. If you don't have this, you can certainly go in with white gouache or you can go in with uh, a little bit of a Prismacolor. White is really a good one. And then also with that same brush, I went ahead and added the shadow of the glass so that we could get all of those details in. And I'm gonna call this one done. And here's the final of this one of the two butterflies sitting on their nectar dish. That glass, when you do it on the stem of the nectar dish there, when you're painting that, you wanna be aware of those shadows and see how that looks. So that's a good thing to remember to observe is where those shadows land whenever you're dealing with glass. Now we'll move on to the third and final painting, the butterfly that is on the leaves. 
When you're placing your butterfly, when you're drawing this one, I would start out with the head. Where do you want that head to be on your painting? And then go from there. Um, I just kind of drew a basic shape, that wedge shape for the wings, and then I went in and added the detail. And again, this one will be also available through a PDF um, where you can just trace it. Going in first with a yellow, this is a lemon yellow, which is a nice cool yellow, which I love when you mix it with a phthalo blue, which is what I'm doing. I'm also mixing with it with uh, the sea glass, which is, oh, what could you use? If you had a turquoise, that would be really nice to mix. Um, I'm also mixing it with a little bit of bamboo green, uh, the phthalo, like I mentioned, and I think some of the cobalt green deep. Something else that you might wanna mix that yellow with is an olive green. And the reason that I went in with the yellow first is because when you look at this reference photo, the color underneath the green is yellow. That's another good a tip of advice for you is to try and hone your powers of observation. When you're painting, yes, our eyes, our brains, we see those as green leaves, but we don't wanna just use one shade of green. That would be really flat and boring. So what makes up green? Well, blue and yellow. So you have to look at the yellow first. You're gonna go lightest to dark with watercolor. So I'm just put it, I put down that yellow first and then went over different kinds of green, different kinds of blues to mix with that yellow while it was wet on the page so that we could create some different depth of those leaves that are going all those different directions. And when it comes to the butterfly, I'm really doing exactly the same thing that I did with the other monarch. First going in with that soul shine, so you could use an Indian yellow, and then coming in with some kind of a red over top of that, you could use a cadmium red, and then finally adding those veins and striations, striations in the wings, um, using that Payne's gray to create the body and the legs and all of those uh, black lines around those pretty little white dots. And now I think what I'm going to do is uh, lift that butterfly off of the leaves. So just going into the darkest green value. Now a shadow is not always going to just be gray. It is a darker value of the color of whatever it is it's already under there. So for instance, this is uh, whatever green that I've got mixed there on my palette with a little bit more Payne's Gray added to it. And I'm just using my Blick Masterstroke number eight. It is a, a shader brush, just any kind of flat brush to push that push the pigment right up against the edge of the butterfly's wing and then get the brush wet and just kind of pull it down. And that will help create that gradient shadow that we've talked about. And here we're gonna do the same thing, just a little bit more sheer right under that top leaf. And then here on top of the wing, um, that leaf itself is a little bit lower. So we're gonna make that, that shadow just a little bit darker. But this part that I'm tapping in right there is kind of a, a lighter shadow. Just continuing that shadow all around the edge of the butterfly, same method, tapping it in, tapping the pigment in very close to the leaf and then pulling it out with a wet brush. Now we're gonna go in with that bleed proof white and add the final highlights on the butterfly and then he will be finished. He or she <laughs> will be all done. And there we are, all done. I hope you guys really enjoyed these three butterflies today. They were a tie on the voting. Um, the, like I said, the one on the rock just won out just a, by, I think, one vote. So thank you so much for letting me know what you'd like to see on this channel. I would love to see your butterfly paintings. If you do decide to post them on social media, go ahead and tag Art on the Creek with a hashtag, or you can mention me with an at sign, and I would love to see what you've got going on. Hope everybody's having a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye now.